Hey guys, Omni here. Welcome back for another breakdown from New Rockstars, this time for episode five of season three of The Mandalorian. If you haven't seen my reaction, go check it out. There's an yet another out of left field cameo that just blew my mind and I did not catch it in the moment. But of course, we'll expand upon that once we get to it in the breakdown. With that all said, if you're not supporting New Rockstars, go check them out, give them a like, subscribe and all that jazz. And, uh, Let's go jump into the breakdown. Here we go. Welcome back. Welcome back to New Rockstars. I'm Eric Boss, and this is a breakdown of The Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 5, Chapter 21, The Pirate. From the Orbesh on Zeb's vest to how those pilots billiards game as a deep cut to A New Hope, sound effects reused from Return of the Jedi, and coming back to Zeb here, hidden details in his VFX design that make him look so good. Let's break down this scene by scene for every last Star Wars Can't wait, man. little visual detail that you might have missed. And big thanks to Boxu for sponsoring this video. More on their tasty offerings later. We open on the pristine gates of Navarro. These were in ruins in season one, so now their repairs this season were a big deal until this episode. The statue of IG-11 in the plaza yeah. remains disassembled from Din and Grief's attempt to reboot him with the Anzellans in chapter 17. And since Din was unable to find a new chip, they really seem to have dropped this. But we'll see if IG-11 comes back in these final few episodes. Grief Karga's city map labels three spots in Orbesh on the left, East Court, in the middle, Pole Cushion, and on the right, Landing Yard. But this planning session gets interrupted when Grief looks down the plaza to see a shadow moving across the yard. And for a second, we think it's an Imperial Star Destroyer, but it's actually Gorian Shard's Cumulus Class Corsair Battleship. The name Corsair comes from Legends, the 2005 Dark Lords and Sith comic from Dark Horse. The Corsair was a Derefin Class Sith Battleship with Sith crystals that could tear out the core of a star. The design of this ship does pay homage to that with its hooked nose, like a bottle opener or the beak of a bird digging for prey. The Cumulus Class Sounds takes good, its name man. from the Cumulus Class clouds. Those are the white puffy types of clouds that fill the sky. Now this ship's hull seems to be painted in a camouflage design. You ain't exactly camouflaging yourself if you're that big up yeah. over the city, but does give it the militaristic look like a tank. That it's not like this is no nope. In the history of its coarse hair name and the looming shadow visual of its cumulusness, it just gives this pirate ship an imperial vibe. As Carson yeah. Tava later explains that this pirate activity gives him a bad feeling about this when it comes That's to a the very good point. First order. Just seems like the pirate nation has been manipulated to chip away at the New Republic and to keep them distracted. Gorian Shard is the Pirate King we met briefly in Chapter 17, played by Nonzo Onozi from Game of Thrones. And keeping oh, him in the tradition, interesting. Like Jones, or I guess in this case, a Greenbeard take on Redbeard or Blackbeard. Grief connects to the call with him, and I like how he takes a moment to steady himself and assume a commanding pose. You know, like we all do before signing <laughs> into the Zoom meetings. But Gorian Shard's hollow projection is set to huge, <clears throat> so he ends up just taking a higher status in this negotiation. And I love it. As Gorian talks, yeah. Grief's bust, which has been restored from chapter 17. It's now in the background and starts outside the frame of Gorian's hollow projection, but moves closer and closer to his mouth, showing how Gorian is devouring Grief's interests here. Gorian scolds Grief about shooting his helmsman, and Grief says, he shot first. It's a great nod to the mm -hmm. famous Han and Greedo shootout in A New Hope, yep. where Han shot first in the original version, but George Lucas changed it for the 1997 special edition so that Greedo shot first, leading to the who shot first, Han shot first debate among fans. Grief bluffs that he's under the protection of the New Republic, and Gorian just laughs that Navarro is an independent system, which to be fair, is independence that Grief told Mando that he wanted in Chapter 17 after they both talked shit That's about true. the New Republic. He's really reaping what he sowed. Gorian says, this isn't Sabacc and you can't bluff your way out of this one, Karga. Referring to the in-universe card game played by Han Solo in Lando Calrissian, Gorian rains cannon fire down on Navarro like, oh say, Thrawn upon Lothal and Rebels, <gasps> creating a lifelong enemy in Ezra Bridger. I think this is going to come back up in the next few episodes as this series pivots to set up Ahsoka. After the initial bombardment, Possibly. the gates of the city are already reduced back to rubble the episode's title of the pirate cuts to a trap that you could just reference damn near any science fiction thing with an orbiting ship like that i mean it's not the only time we've seen that it's not the only thorns not the only one that's ever done something similar to that in this universe in the canon even so i don't know we know he's coming but i don't know if like it this <laughs> Thrawn is uh, Eric's Mephisto for this universe, so expect everything, no matter how minute, to end up connecting back to that, but who knows, maybe it will. Tropical Cove that looks like the kind of place a traditional pirate would plunder, but instead of a sea shanty sung by Barbosa, the closed captioning lists this music as psychedelic rock music playing, <laughs> which is just incredible, and I love the wow. vocalization here. Wow, weird. <laughs> Reminds me of the absolute jam yeah. that we heard as we soared into Niamos on Andor. Remember that? Yep. 
We see an X-wing. It also reminds me of the music in uh, um, Fallen Order. Guarding this cove is a Y-wing lands in a landing yard alongside several other Y-wings, but they look a bit more sparse and less equipped than when we saw them in Return of the Jedi. Remember chapter 19? We learned that the New Republic is still in the process of decommissioning the Rebel Alliance fleet. Inside there are X-wing and Y-wing pilots in orange and in blue. Now the blue squadron was supposed to be decommissioned after the Battle of Scarif, but perhaps the New Republic era has brought them back. If you watch Rogue One closely, the Ghost was among that fleet in mm -hmm. the Battle of Scarif. Zeb might have been there. That might be why Zeb is now part of this blue squadron we see a few pilots playing a billiards game True. this was from a removed scene from the 1977 star wars yeah the same game was played at the toshi station that was the same station that we visited in the pilot of the book of boba fett the teal drink they're drinking is bachka that's the in universe booze characters have been drinking in the mandalorian like in the bar in most pelgo yep. and finnick shan and boba fett were drinking some when they took java's throne from bib fortuna above the bar are various trophies of helmets and droid heads like the opening chrome based intro sequence of every episode you can see an imperial probe droid that's interesting also an imperial mount Destroyed, an RA-7 protocol yep. droid head, there's some brown stormtrooper helmets, a black imperial pilot helmet, scout trooper helmets, and behind the bar, the drink kegs are the same prop design from the Mos Eisley Cantina in A New Hope that would later be repurposed as the prop of the IG assassin droid head. Sitting at the yep. far end of the bar in the foreground, three big cameos, directors and producers of the series. I literally, in the moment, I only zeroed in on Deborah. You know, I missed Rick and, uh, <laughs> and Dave. Right there, right there. I mean, he's, it's the back of his head, but I should have known better. Is it Dave Filoni, who plays Trapper Wolf, Rick Famuyiwa, who plays mm -hmm. Jib Dodger. Jib Dodger is probably a joke to like a jib on a set that Rick Famuyiwa might have been hit on the head with at some point. Jib Dodger. And then Deborah Chow, Sash Ketter. We saw these New Republic X-Wing pilots at the end of chapter six in season one. Yep. And since then, Famuyiwa has now been promoted to executive producer alongside Dave Filoni and John Favreau. And oh, really? Dave Filoni wears his iconic wide-brimmed hat, which I'm pretty sure is just glued to his head like Evan <laughs> Feige's ball cap is to his. And that Snivian bartender is played by Misty Rosas, who did the physical work of the Ugnaught Quill oh, in season cool. one. We catch up with Captain Carson Tiva, the great Paul Sun Hyung Lee, who wears a sick pilot jacket with patches, including one with a rebel insignia on the sleeve and an orange patch. It felt very maverick to me. With the freaking Rancor. Is he part of the Rancor squadron? Awesome. There's also a blue and red patch that might refer to his home planet of Adelphi. Sir I've seen that crest before. But I feel like it was in Halo. <laughs> Uh, my birthday is next week on April 7th. And since I can't go to Star Wars Celebration, my birthday is next week as well. And it's all the way in the UK. If anyone wants to get me one of these jackets, I wear XL and I want that. Joining him is Zeb from Rebels, voiced by Stephen Bloom, as he is in the show. So Zeb or Gara Zeb or Elios yeah. joined Harrison. All right, real quick. I do need to touch on this because like I, I didn't even like entertain the idea that it was Zeb because it was so nonchalant. You know, he just sat down, hung out. So my, I just automatically assumed it was just some random Lasat that was just part of the rebellion or the New Republic as they are now. And I guess like the audio like was very quiet to me, like the way he was talking and carrying himself. So I didn't immediately pick out Steve Bloom's voice, which I should have. I've had stuff signed by him. I've met him. I should know that voice. But I don't know, maybe it was the music, maybe I just wasn't, I don't know, something about I just didn't put two and two together because, or maybe in my brain, I was just assuming all Asats just kind of sounded the same. I don't know what. But I was just like, there's no way this is Zeb. And then I was like, I just randomly dropped that. I was like, man, I hope Zeb's okay. And he's literally like right there. If you watch with the subtitles on, it also does not include his name. The only place his name appears... He's in the credits. And that's when I found out, because I watched just to see, because he had lines, so they would have had to credit the person. And that's that's how I found out. Damn, man. I'm still kicking myself about that. And he looks so good. They really did a good job with him. Because he's the first live-action Lasat that we've seen, right? That I can think of. Ah. Uh. Damn. Dula, Kane and Jarrus, Ezra Bridger, Sabine Wren, and that little f 
Chopper on the Ghost, and he will be the yeah. fourth character to show up in live action from the crew of the Ghost in the upcoming Ahsoka series, alongside mm -hmm. Harrison Dula, Sabine Wren, and Ezra Bridger. And the fact that he shows up now in this New Republic pilot bar tells us that Hera will likely soon be introduced for this Ahsoka series. I did see the Ahsoka teaser at last year's celebration, and we do see that Twilight head from behind. His flight vest really? is standing Hell yeah, orange. man. That's hard to translate at first, but that's because it's upside down, so that the pilot would be able to look down at his chest and read it. And it translates to pull to in flight. So our mm. man is pulling a Marty McFly and wearing a life preserver in case his Y-Wing ever crash landed in the water. The VFX work on Zeb is just so good and it's all in the details. Like look closely mm -hmm. at his face on this line. Request permission to intercede. They haven't returned to dispatch in weeks. They're swamped. Yeah, the frequent blinking, the way his nose wrinkles, and his temple twitches as he awkwardly has to God, it's so good. This is. Just a few subtle gestures along with the limited screen time and the well mapped I should have known just from how much effort they put into realizing this character, man. Naturalistic lighting, and yeah, that worn down upside down Orbesh. All these details work together to make it feel like the guy is sitting here with us. And I'm mm. not afraid to say it. On Disney Plus, Lucasfilm has much better VFX than Marvel does. And I believe it's because Lucasfilm's animators work in house. And these folks grew up with the animated versions of these characters and have spent their entire lives dreaming about bringing them into live action. Whereas Marvel tends to outsource their VFX and they pit these companies against each other, they work them to the bone, and all that creative exhaustion ends up showing. And Zeb says, Good luck. You're gonna need it. Using the same intonation as Han Solo to Lando in Return of the Jedi. Good luck. You're gonna need it. So Teva goes to the New Republic building on Coruscant and meets with Colonel Tuttle, Tim Meadows. That yellow astromech droid is the same one who visited Dr. Pershing's desk in Chapter 19, and the hard disks on that tray are the same prop design yep. as the disk with the Death Star plans that was handed to Leia at the end of Rogue One. In fact, Grief Karga initially recording this message does feel a lot like Leia recording the message and handing it to R2-D2. Elia Kane comes back and she butts in to mention that Navarro never actually signed the New Republic Charter. The New Republic <laughs> Charter! <laughs> That is exactly that vibe. Oh, God. She's such a snake, dude. He brought up in Claudia Gray's bloodline as a kind of constitution that outlines the role of positions like Chancellor and First Senator. Quill actually brought it up in Chapter 7, referring to the whole Finder's Keeper's Clause of him now being able to claim IG-11's body himself. And stated as my own in accordance with the Charter of the New Republic. Tava notices the Amnesty Program badge on mm -hmm. Kane's uniform, which is an Orbesh A. And this scene quotes new rock stars. These events can all be connected. <laughs> I think that's a bit of a leap. Kane used this as an example of why Navarro should learn to sign the charter. And Tava says, by letting them suffer, and Kane smiles. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a performative gesture to show that she's not taking it personally, but also she didn't really have to hide a smile because she loves watching people suffer. Like, notice how she says it often takes a new perspective before one can see the light, which totally feels like she's internally picturing Dr. Pershing seeing the colorful lights that she used to torture him. Tava says that she didn't see the light, she was captured, which is basically this show's version of. You're talking about your court ordered community service? I don't need a judge to tell me to keep my community clean. But he did, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. That, it, he makes a point. It is very pointed. It is, it is also extremely, in its own kind of way, judgmental because you had people like Pershing, who I truly do believe was just doing what he thought was right and got swept up by the wrong people. And there are a lot of people that were with the Empire that were, it was the only option or it was the best option for their families and stuff like that or whatever. Like, there's a multitude of reasons, but there, there, there are people like her who are still embedded so deeply in it. And they're just using this as a way to work from the inside to cripple every chance that they can headed toward the first order saying there's something happening out there all these events it's not a coincidence and before it becomes too big for the act it'll be too late captain tava tracks yep. down the mandalorian covert saying one of them served with him in the rebellion and snitched and it was r5d4 remember pelimoto reminded us in chapter 18 that r5 did serve the rebellion which i had thought referred to that certain point of view story when r5 intentionally blew his motivator so that r2 could go with luke but i guess there was more history there then here's tava's request to help grief and he makes his case to the rest of the covert carrying the 
God, I love this scene. I love the way they repurpose it from a forging tool to a speaker's gavel. Din acknowledges that many of these guys once fought grief in chapter three of the series, and Din declares, perhaps it is time for us to live in the light once again, a place where we are welcome so that our culture may flourish and our children may feel what it is to play in the sunlight. I love how Grogu smiles at that because our boy just yeah. wants to play. But Din is suddenly redefining what it means to be a Mandalorian because some mm -hmm. would say it's really their culture to be shielded from the sunlight by always having to wear their helmets. But I love how later in this episode, the armorer will see this light when bo is framed in a beam of sunlight and is told to remove her helmet. I like how Paz Vizsla doesn't just rise up to just signal to Din that he's on his side. He only speaks because he heard all those nervous murmurs and yeah. he knows that Din needed him to win over wow. anyone on the fence. Yeah, I love that whole antithesis. moment, man. He smartly gets the attention of the detractors yeah. until he reframes his whole argument as reasons why to save grief. Because we are Mandalorians. Rhetorically, this is the same tactic McConaughey's character uses in A Time to Kill, explaining why Samuel L. Jackson was justified in killing a Klansman who raped his daughter by telling the jury to imagine what happened to the girl with vivid detail, and then closes with, I want you to picture that little girl. And now imagine she's white. Now I guess it's not as artful or as powerful of a speech here, but you get the idea. Paz says that bo didn't give up on my son's life even when the rest of us did, signaling that even he gave up a bit on his son's survival prospects. As bo yeah, shows that her that's true. Class fighter transport, she faces the shoulder that bears the Mythosar signet on that new armor piece of the armor just cast for her last episode, appealing to the thing that unites all of them instead of turning to show her night owl history that actually broke off from the Death Watch that these guys are derived from. They mm -hmm. exit hyperspace and the planet of Navarro zips in at them, a visual that will always look so rad to me. And we see how these drunken pirates it, have now overtaken Navarro. A poor astromech droid just bumping into the rubble until he sparks, just offing himself because he hates it here. It really is like these pirates are drunkenly singing. <laughs> Yo, God. Oh, yo, oh, a pirate's life for me as they've overtaken Isla to Soro. And you know, that ride seems like it's all fun and games, but we forget how those people's lives were ruined. Those pirates execute the mayor by drowning them in a well. They abuse the donkey. It's not okay. And you really <laughs> see how that includes them retaking the school that Vane wanted to get drunk in before. Oh, you see that I didn't even board. notice the that. I thought that was a random was building. Oh. First mate with a striped shirt and red bandana, who's clearly modeled to look like Smee from Peter Pan. That's oh, what I Peter. thought he even acted like him and sounded like him. Pan and Star Wars. <sighs> That ain't Star Wars, bro. Grief radios to Mando that they got him out number 10 to 1, and Mando tricks one snub fighter to crash into another and says, I like those odds. Enough. Dude, like, that made me think of that one of my favorite lines from the Halo franchise when the Covenant fleet is facing off against the UNSC and the Sang Healy Alliance, so like with the shipmaster out there and his uh, navigator is like, sir, they outnumbered us, what, I think it was like three to one. His response is then, then it is an even fight. <laughs> God, that line still gives me so much, so much, so many chills, man. Not to Han Solo again. Sir, the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. Never tell me the odds. bo drops the first wave to clear the street, and the Anzalans say, Everybody come and look! After those Kawaki monkey lizards got shot by the pirates earlier, now one points yeah. to Wanda to warn the Mandalorians, telling us that these things are far smarter than we realized, and just makes it kind of disturbing that Jawas were roasting them yeah. on sticks in the pilot episode. Paz lays down some heavy repeating blasts right? fire, but they get by. I mean, it actively knew what to laugh at in the Jabba scene and all that. So like they are intelligent of in a, in a sense, but I did love that after they were shot at, it was like so ready to narc on them down by a Trandoshan pirate with a cannon and grief sweet. Meanwhile, up above, Din's N1 sends a stump fighter into the Corsair, and Gorian Shard shouts, Dang Ferric! You know, the recurring Star Wars profanity. Dang Ferric! The armor gets into the suite and shows that Forging Hammers ain't just for taking turns to speak. She clubs them one by one and uses her tongs to pinch yep. a Nikto spinal column. Youch! It's like old man Marley taking out the wet bandits. Gorian refuses to retreat, saying he'll do it in a puffer pig's eye. Puffer pigs are creatures that sniff out minerals that we saw in Rebels. Din and bo are able to bring down the Corsair. This is the same sound effect made by the Star Destroyer that crashes into the Death Star in Return of the Jedi. Now this 
dives into the side of an active volcano and we see the ground quake. It's a seismic event that I would be nervous around anywhere with yeah. hot springs and active lava flows, but it doesn't matter. They all cheer and we hear those Anzellans shout, it's gonna be okay, which is something I'm just gonna start cheering whenever I'm excited because that's all we can really hope for, right? That it's just gonna be okay. Now in this cheering crowd, I love what I call extra extras, like this super psyched out person in front of the N1 because if you've ever been on a production set, for sound purposes, extras often have to emote and cheer silently and they'll fill in the sound effect later during the dubbing process. <laughs> so this person is just really screaming silently here. Thank you. Grief declares that the territory from the Lava Flats to Bullock Canyon will go to the Mandalorians. This is a wonderful nod to Jeremy Bullock, who died relatively recently. When All he right, with his yeah. Boy, in the original trilogy. Aww. Between this and Ahmed Best last week, I really like how they're showing their love to the cast. Paz escorts bo back into the sewers where they once hid, and we hear Ludwig Jorensen's moody electric guitar strings from the pilot episode. <laughs> and the armor recall the great forge of Mandalore. The armor says it was large and ornate and the air rang with the music of a hundred hammers. To her, hammering is music. As in chapter 17, the strikes of the hammer were synced with Joseph Shirley's drum music. Their armor compares the great forge to this simple one. Now both serve the same purpose. She's coming to terms with the fact that the ornate mm -hmm. ceremonial trappings of the Mandalorian's past are not the way for the future of the Mandalorian people. And that open-minded tolerance will attract greater numbers. That is why she tells Bo to remove her helmet. Not yep. to trap her, but to allow her to be a Mandalorian in her own way, trusting that the Mythosar presenting itself to her was a more valid sign important. The armorer says, I was taught that the Mythosar existed only in legends, and yet you saw it. It is a sign that the next age is upon us. Yes, the phrase only in legends, another double meaning, as much as what we know about the Mythosar <laughs> yeah. really comes from legends or expanded universe literature. The armorer joins a helmetless bo saying that she walks in both worlds and can bring all tribes together. Paz Vizla turns it in Jaren uncertain, as the two of them previously dueled over this question of over Apostate. So when the armorer pledges to retake Mandalore, I don't think it's a false plot to set up Bo-Katan to fail again. The drum music swells with pride. It casts her at the end of a redemption arc. But my question to you is, does this redemption feel earned to you as a viewer? Isn't it a bit odd for the armorer to take Bo-Katan at her word when it comes to seeing the Mythosar? And wasn't it Din and Paz who really gave better speeches here and did more to win this battle? Like, don't get me wrong, I really like Bo-Katan. I think she could be a great leader. It just feels like the armorer is weirdly rushed and eager to embrace her. Like she automatically baptized her she breaks the helmet rules for her. In fact, I'm now half wondering if the armor might secretly be bo sister Satine, who somehow survived. Somehow Satine returned. I, know. I mean, that's a big theory. Another one is, crap, I'm blanking on her name right now. Though I don't think the person I'm thinking of would ever allow this to happen but whatever it's crazy it's my bad shit reach theory in fact i hope it's wrong if, if this ends up being the case i'll be kind of mad carson tiva ends this episode coming upon the ghost ship a new republic lambda class shuttle it's hull breached lieutenant reed who he radios with is as before played by max lloyd jones who is a stand-in double for the dh luke skywalker in chapter 16. the astromex probe scans a shuttle with an eerie planner beam that looks exactly like the light in james cameron's aliens when ripley is found in cryosleep now remember reed yeah i knew that it was reminding me of something and I just could not place it that Moff Gideon was escorted personally by Kara Dune, who he said then went off to join another division. But I guess it is possible that one of the corpses in the shuttle could be Kara Dune, and that, like Poochie, Kara Dune died on the way back to her home planet. He notices a chunk of Beskar be. alloy in the wall. He assumes Mandalorians did this. Now, despite the fact that there are other Mandalorian tribes out there, some may be more vengeful, I just don't think Mandalorians did this, because Mandalorians would have just killed Gideon instead of extracting him and kidnapping him. And I don't think any Mandalorian would leave any Beskar behind. Mandalorian just aren't that sloppy when it comes to their best guard. So yeah. I think this was whoever bombed bo -Katan's home. Someone framing the Mandalorians. Someone actively hostile the Mandalorians. Perhaps Thrawn, who might be trying to frame or trying to aggravate Sabine Wren, who is a Mandalorian from Cronest. Next episode's supposed to be a big one. I think we're going to see Thrawn in it. And I believe Grand Admiral Thrawn could prove to be the ultimate pirate of this episode's title. Hey, a reminder to subscribe to our Interesting new channel. Interesting thought. The Deep Dive. I mean, I definitely do think it is somebody like with a vendetta. And I do think it is just a little too obvious. While it very well could be one of these other clans, or like I had posited, maybe some element of how Gideon was able to be so effective on Mandalore and end up with the Darksaber is with the help of other Mandalorians who were maybe turncoats or had something else in mind or maybe a deal or alliance at play. 
the other possibility is, you know, Beskar isn't exclusive to Mandalorians. It is their primary, like, ritualistically, it's very important to them with their weaponry, their gear, their armor. But, like, we've seen that other people have acquired it over time in various different ways. It has been taken. And I think the that the vocalization of that from Carson is is possibly a red herring for the truth, at least. But you never know. We don't know yet. We'll have to wait and find out. But um, another person that definitely has that want and that quest for, you know, dismantling them, maybe physically or even reputationally, is Gideon to strike back for what has happened to him. Uh, a lot of fun stuff, though, in the in the breakdown in this episode. I'm still, again, so salty about the Zeb thing just because, again, I just, I was just in such belief that it wouldn't be Zeb, that I just didn't allow myself to, like, jump the gun and be like, oh, hey, Zeb, when it was. But guys, what'd you think? Were there any Easter eggs that you guys caught that they missed here? If so, sound off the comments. Let me know your thoughts down below. We'll carry on the conversation after the video. Make sure to subscribe to New Rockstars. And if you enjoyed this reaction, make sure to like, comment, subscribe here. And check out my reaction if you have not. And before I go, I want to shout out our channel legends. Manny Share, Ryan, Karen, Jason Coleman, Philly Vane, Yori, Corey Scott, Margaret Grace, Melita, Robert Anguiano, Raven McGann, Jeffrey Hale, M. Sephiroth, Jake Cantrell, Josh Lee, and Aaron Myers. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. And everybody who's been supporting the channel and helping us grow. Thank you guys so much. And that's it for this video, guys. I'll see you all next week with the next one. Until then, may the force be with you always. Take care, everybody.